let me offer a few remarks on the implication of the COVID crisis from, for the labor market uh, in my final minutes. So as you all know, as of today, recording a few days after the initial meeting, uh, on May 8th, 2020, the unemployment rate is uh, approaching 15%. 33 and a half million people, Americans have applied for unemployment uh, insurance. And so this is a, a labor market catastrophe of the type that we have not seen since the Great Depression. I wanna now step back and say, uh, what did things look like before uh, the crisis and why they will probably not look quite that way afterward. So here's where we were headed before the crisis. Uh, really four points, and I'm gonna illustrate these pictorially. One was that we had a kind of a barbell economy, polarized employment growth and high wage, high education jobs and low wage, low education jobs simultaneously. Uh, that movement into low wage, uh, low education jobs uh, was personal services. It was concentrated among non-college workers who are the majority of the US workforce. Um, despite the low wages in that type of work, we had a tightening labor market uh, reflecting four forces. Uh, one was a rising dependency ratio, meaning the retirement of the baby boom. The second was small cohorts of young workers entering the labor market due to low fertility. A third was vastly curtailed immigration as a reflection of a changing policy. And the fourth was rising projected employment in personal services, uh, having to do with changes in consumption patterns and again with aging. Uh, so the expectation going forward was rising wage pressure in low paid jobs. Let me illustrate each of those points very quickly and then tell you how I think things have changed. So first, this shows uh, what many of you will have seen before, the kind of a polarized labor market. Uh, occupations are ranked here in large categories from lowest paid to highest paid. And you see a kind of a, a, a U shape where the two ends are growing. On the left hand side is employment growth in health and personal services, cleaning and protective services, uh, operator, operator and labor jobs. Uh, these are, uh, many of these are hands-on positions. They involve helping, assisting, or caring for others. They're growing rapidly, they're low paid. On the right-hand side, growing rapidly are professional, technical, and managerial jobs. I'm sure we all understand uh, how important and uh, well remunerated they have become over the last several decades in the US economy. Contracting, of course, are production, operative, clerical, and administrative support, and some sales occupations. These are kind of the middle skill a set of jobs that have been uh, hollowed out as a function both of computerization, of office work, and the decline of manufacturing, some of that having to do with automation, some of that having to do with trade. Important to understand that that polarization is concentrated among non-college workers, workers uh, with uh, high school or lower education. Uh, that's where the movement out of the middle and towards the left-hand side of the diagram uh, has occurred. That's a movement of uh, non-college workers out of office, out of factories, and into entertainment, recreation, uh, security, uh, health, uh, food service, uh, et cetera. Um, it's, the US uh, labor market has not delivered much wage growth for less educated adults uh, since uh, really 1980. Uh, but if you look at these figures, which show the evolution of real wages indexed to their 1962 level uh, up to uh, 2017, what you can see as uh, this kind of uh, upward check uh, in the last couple of years, especially among the least educated, though not exclusively, uh, reflecting the tightening labor market and the rate wage growth that was starting to occur even in relatively low paid jobs as a function of the high pressure labor market. That was very good news. Um, and in fact, if you look at the projections according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics of the types of jobs that are supposed to grow, were supposed to grow over the next decade, um, uh, they, these are the top 20 these top 20 account for 55% of all projected job growth over 10 year period. So 4.6 million of 8.4 million jobs. They are concentrated in these low paid services, health aids, food and cleaning services, labor occupations. These are mostly non-college jobs. They mostly pay below the medium wage. So these are not jobs that we're excited about. You know, many, many people are making careers in. However, they were numerous. And uh, the fact they're numerous uh, creates uh, wage pressure, which is a positive force from the perspective of, of, uh, in, of improving opportunity or at least labor market conditions for less educated non-college adults. This was abetted by the aging of the population. 
age, old age dependency ratios, meaning the ratio of people age 65 plus to 16 to 64, are rising steeply. The US much less than other countries, but even so, it was anticipated that between 2020 and 2050, uh, we would have moved from an age dependency ratio of about 26% to about 36%. Uh, and you can see, if you look at the age distribution of the US uh, population between 2000 and 2020, how much of the mass has moved from the working age years, that's the red line with the peak in the middle, uh, to uh, senior adults uh, out of the uh, prime age work. Okay, so that was the stage, uh, setting the stage, and the expectation was this combination of rising demand for these uh, uh, typically low education services, the aging population, uh, slow uh, uh, population growth or you know, small, slow entry of, uh, of new workers and curtailed immigration, all of which would create a high pressure labor market for uh, non-college workers. And that is better than a low pressure labor market from the point of view of wage growth uh, and employment rates. So why might the co post COVID labor market look different, even let's imagine that, you know, we all began to return to work today. Uh, well, I think there are, there are six factors. Uh, one is there's going to be a penumbra of risk surrounding many in-person services until there is a reliable uh, vaccine. Uh, and so that will cause just a de-densification of workplaces, of shopping uh, malls, of restaurants. Uh, and so that will change, at least in the short and medium term, the demand for many activities. More profoundly, uh, I think this is going to be an automation accelerating or an automation forcing event. Of course, we've had uh, you know, a proliferation of artificial intelligence, of robotics, of online services into work. Um, but this will speed that up. Uh, and I, uh, speaking with folks today saying, you know, people who are running factories are discovering, you know, they're running with it, uh, you know, at 15 or 20 percent of their previous workforce. They're finding they can get more, much more done than they thought they could. Obviously, we're discovering we can do many more things online remotely than we thought we could. And that lesson, those lessons will not be unlearned. So I think that this period of labor withdrawal, despite uh, even within, you know, without a necessary withdrawal of demand, means that when we get back to work, firms will organize differently and it will likely be less intense, uh, labor intensive. A third factor that I think will prove quite important is in the US economy, and in fact in many advanced economies, over the last 30 years, we've seen a reallocation of sales and value added towards larger firms. Uh, some call this the superstar firms phenomenon. Uh, and uh, larger firms are often more productive, they're often more profitable, but they are less labor intensive. A larger share of their value added is paid to shareholders, to capital, to profits, and less to workers. And so because this crisis is very likely to weed out many small and medium-sized firms, which are less capitalized, they have less savings, they have less access to capital markets, when, when the tide recedes, uh, uh, we will find that the firms that are left standing are the larger ones. And that will likely cause a permanent downward shift in labor share of national income of a couple of percentage points, one or two percentage points. There's no reason to think that we will quickly rebound from that. So it will accelerate a process that was underway. A fourth factor is a likely change in demand for services that I expect some of them will be quite durable changes. I think it's very likely that we will see reduced business travel Many people have learned that you, know, you don't really need to show up anymore. Uh, and this will lead to a decline in the hospitality sector to some extent. And recognizing that business travelers, they are the ones who pay, you know, pay for the prop, who basically make airlines profitable, that make hotels profitable by paying full fare on weekdays. Uh, they go to expensive restaurants on expense accounts and so on. And uh, a lot of the tourism industry is kind of supported by the kind of layer of profits that comes from business travel. Uh, so if there is a reduction in business travel, that will affect demand for restaurant workers, hotel workers, transportation workers, all kinds of cleaning services. This will affect service demand. Second of all, secondly, a, a rise in telecommuting will also uh, cause reduced demand for many of these cleaning services, security, even people going out to lunch during the workday. Uh, and I expect that we will learn to telecommunicate Tele telecommute more uh, based on our, our few months uh, cooped up at home. Finally, and this is, does not take a crystal ball, the retail sector, you know, which was already contracting, is uh, 
uh, is shrinking very rapidly. We've seen a number of high profile bankruptcies. Uh, retail sector employment provides millions of not very low wage, not very high paid jobs, but still many millions of jobs. I think that process will be uh, of contraction will be vastly accelerated. So uh, to conclude, this ongoing wage pressure in low paid services that, that I at least was confidently forecasting, I am not confident about anymore. Uh, the uh, forces, uh, you know, the, these multiple forces are going to cause employment in those activities to shrink more rapidly than we would have anticipated. Um, one wild card here, I think, that I don't have much insight into it, but I do think it's worth considering, is whether we're going to see a rise in early retirement, uh, where many people, older workers who have left the labor force during this crisis may not return. Uh, it's not, uh, in other crises, we said, oh, that you know, people couldn't afford to retire uh, because their savings had been wiped out. At present, actually, the stock market has not lost nearly as much value as you would expect, given all these other forces. So it's possible. Uh, that, that there will in fact be a movement into retirement. If so, that will also change labor demand. That actually will create additional demand for prime age workers uh, who are still around. So uh, uh, I think I'll just conclude by saying uh, it's unlikely that the post-COVID labor market will immediately return or even necessarily ever return to the trend we were on uh, in the pre-COVID labor market. Uh, but in the best case scenario, many workers will be recalled and, uh, and uh, as this reallocation occurs, we will hopefully make uh, the most of the opportunity to retrain people and help target them to the emerging opportunities uh, that uh, come about.